Hi everyone and welcome back to Feverbee's summer lecture series. So this is the final lecture of the five weeks that we've been doing. And I hope so far that you've enjoyed it and you found these lectures quite useful. What our goal was from the very beginning was to change the nature of the discussions that were taking place about communities. If you read as many books and blogs and literature about communities that's out there as we do, then you know that you can summarize a lot of this stuff as how to be nice to people online. And what we've tried to show over the last five weeks or so is that being nice to people online is important, but it's essentially the lowest level of community work. And it's important that from now on, we all raise our game, that we all become very, very good at more of the strategic side of building communities, that we understand how to build a community team, that we understand how to establish a community strategy, that we understand how to influence our own communities, how to create a community con concept that we know is going to work. So what we try to do is develop a series of lectures which is going to change the way that a lot of us approach our communities, make sure that we can optimize our own time and make sure that we deliver more value to the organizations that we work for. So originally this week, we were going to have a lecture about the community life cycle and community strategy. And then about 30 minutes ago, I changed my mind and changed the slides and put a lot of things together really quickly because I felt that first, we've done the strategy before, and we've done the life cycle, we've touched upon it um, several times in the promotion for the course in the past. And also I felt that given what the response was to the ROI webinar that we did two weeks ago, that there's an opportunity to go a little more advanced than what we were doing then. What we covered last week was the community management framework, which was essentially all the different tasks that you can be doing in your community. So once you know what's wrong with your community, once you know how far your community has progressed through the, through the life cycle, then you know exactly what to work on. You can take these tasks and put it into your average day. So everything connects to each other. But you can't do that unless you know how to measure your online community, unless you know how to track the health of, uh, of your community and to track the, pro the progress of your community. So what we're going to try and do today, if I put this webinar together correctly in the last half an hour, is go through this together. So I can explain what we do from a, well, for our clients. So when an organization comes to us, I can explain how we measure their community and how we put them on the, on the right track to make their community a success. But let's begin as, you, as usual with a couple of questions here. And this is one that we, I'm expecting a mixed response about. What should you do if 50 members of your community are complaining about a site change that you've recently made? Given the nature of, of, of what this webinar is, I'm hoping most of you will get this right. So you can answer using the question box on the right hand side of your screen on the GoToWebinar control panel. So what should you do if 50 members of your community are complaining about a site change that you've recently made? <laughs> Joshua says, shut the, shut the community down. Kristen says, explain to them and all, all of the members why the changes were made and create instructions on how to use the new, fe the new features. David says, nothing. Millie says, not act. Okay, most of you are getting this broadly right. Um, Jeff says, ask more detail about their complaints. Nick says, see if it's had an impact on activity. Kathy says, mitigate the damage and distract them, do a survey. Kathleen says, uh, re reply pri privately and get a boilerplate, a boilerplate answer. So here's the problem. If 50 members of your, of your complain of your community rather are complaining about a site change that you've made, you have no idea if that site change is bad or not. The problem is that members that are happy about a site change you've made won't write in and tell you how happy you are. 
So on the surface, from your perspective, it looks like something bad is happening. But you can't tell what's actually going on here unless you look at your data behind this. So you need to identify two different things here. First, what percentage of members are complaining about a site about the site change? Most of you in your answers actually um, actually mentioned this. If you only have 100 members in your community, then perhaps that's a big issue. If you have 1,000 or 10,000 members in, in, in your community and only 50 are complaining about a, about a site change, then that's not so, so much. Second, what members can't complain about is usually irrelevant compared to what they're actually doing. Take Facebook, for example. Facebook are very well known for this. They don't look at what members are complaining about. They look at what people are doing. So when they introduced the wall feature, for example, and lots of people began complaining about that, or when they introduced the um, new Facebook homepage and lots of people are complaining about that, what they did is that they sit tight and look at what their data says. Did the level of growth and activity increase or not? Did it decline or not? And what they managed to do here was actually see if the level of activity in, uh, in the community went up or down. So they're using their data to track what's actually happening in, in that community. So let's have another question. Where should you focus most of your time on the community to get the best results? And this is a little bit of a trick question. Sorry, everyone. I've just realised that I can't see what your answers are because my other, my 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 other laptop has died. So here's the problem with the way most people approach this: is that they have no idea where to focus their time to get the best results because they have no data that shows them what's working and what's not working. And until they know what's working, they're not able to to focus their efforts. So imagine, for example, that you're trying to grow your community. You want to increase the number of members that are participating in your community. How would you go about doing that? Well, some people would try different channels, do different tactics. But what a data-driven community manager would do is look at which channels are giving them the members that actually convert into regular participants of that community. So then they know they can spend more time specifically on these members. So they can optimize their time as a result of doing this. There are four questions we're going through here. This is the, thir the uh, third one that I want you to answer. What is the biggest challenge in your community right now? What right now is the biggest problem that your community faces? And when you're answering this, I want you to tell me how you got to that answer as well. Hi everyone, I'm sorry for what just happened. Um, I'm trying to use a spare laptop so I can see your, your responses and the laptop died and then I tried joining in and then either way it was a big mess. So I'm not gonna be able to read what you're responding so I'm just gonna go through the webinar. So the biggest problem in your community right now is probably a problem that you don't know about. So for example, we've worked with organizations in, in the past where they all tell us that the biggest challenge in their community might, might be members arguing with each other. But then we'll look at the data. We'll look at everything that's going on in that community. And what we very often find is that the number of newcomers that are converting to regulars, for example, might be one in a thousand. So every thousand people that are visiting the, 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 the community only one of them converts into an active member of that community. But unless you're tracking your data, you don't know what's going on. 
you don't know um, what the biggest issues in your community are, because this is what we call an unseen issue. Another question that comes up a lot is how successful have your growth, your motivation, your content, your influence and your conversion efforts been this month? And a lot of community professionals aren't able to answer these questions because they're not tracking them. And because they're not tracking it, they don't know what's working and what's not working. So they can't optimize their time as a result. And as a result, they can't tweak and they can't change what they're doing. They can't make sure that they're using every available minute they have to get the best out of their community efforts. So what we want to cover today is what we call this wonderful world of data, where everything can be measured. And we're going to measure the, these things to help us build better communities. What we want to be able to do by measuring data is to deal with the unseeing issues, to deal with the things that we don't know are going wrong in our communities. So for example, you might be tracking the level of activity in, uh, in your community every month, or you might be tracking the number of members that are joining your community every month. Or it's very common for people just to track the number of people that are joining the platform without tracking how many people are actually active in that community. But then you can end up with a situation where your active members are less and less active every single month. And as a result, your community is heading towards oblivion, but you might not even know it. And this will be an unseen issue until the very, very end. Or data will also help you respond correctly to the vocal minorities in your community. If you have five to 10 members that are complaining about an issue in that community, that could be a sign that, so that something is wrong. Or it could be a sign that you have a vocal minority in, in the community that doesn't represent what most people in the community think. Measuring data will also help you allocate your time. One of the questions that comes up very often is, if you only have X number of hours to spend on the community, where should I spend my time? Or where should you spend your, 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 your time if you only have, say, 10 hours or 15 hours a week? Well, if you have your data and you can see what's working and what's not working, you can immediately cut out all the things that aren't working and focus on the things that give you the best results. So you can, alloc you can allocate your time accordingly, solely to the things that work best. That's why this question alone is so difficult to answer, because you need to know your data first. You need to know what's working, what's not working, and only then can you optimize your time. So by the end of today, we want to be able to identify the key metrics, the key metrics of success. So what should we be measuring in our communities? We want to be able to collect data in the appropriate manner, a manner where our own biases won't affect the, the, the results. So we have a process and a spreadsheet that we can use to collect that data in a way it's going to show what's really happening. And the scary thing about doing this is that the results might show that the community is not doing well. And that's a very scary thing for a community professional to deal with but it's a reality in the line of work that you're in. Third, we want to be able to identify where the community is in the life cycle. So we know what the life cycle is already. We touched upon this already last week. What we want to do this week is to identify how you actually get that data that tells you where the community is. And finally, we want to be able to highlight potential areas of concern and improvement. Essentially, what we're going to do today is tell you in our own client process how we do a full review of a community and tell them what's going wrong and what they should spend their time doing. If you want to advance to the strategist roles, if you want to advance to the higher levels of the community profession, then you have to be able to measure the, the, the success of community managers. Not just communities, but community managers as well. Different organizations have different ways of measuring an online community. One of the most well, most well known is the Lithium process. Lithium has what's called the Lithium Community Health Index, which is a very well-meaning number of metrics and a, form, and a formula that, that they use. 
But I think we can all agree this is a very complicated for, formula to be using. And it's undecipherable for most of the, for most of the people that are watching this right, right, right now. What we do need is a simpler process of doing this. So this will be a process that measures the success of a community and the health of a community through three broad metrics. The first one is growth. So we want to know how many members are participating in the community. We want to know how many members are active in the community. And notice we're using the word active there. The number of registered members you have is a completely meaningless metric. It doesn't matter how many people have joined your community. Because people don't delete their accounts when they leave a community, or they rarely delete their accounts, the number of registered members keeps going up and up and up. And there's a tendency, and a very misleading ten, um, tendency it is, to only report the number of registered members because that number always goes up and looks good. But in reality, we know that's, for lack of, of, of a better term, we know that's crap we know that the number of people that are participating in a community can go up and it can go down. That's why we don't track the number of registered members in a community. We only look at the number of active members in a community. And by active members, we're referring to members that have made a contribution within the previous 30 days. Next, we want to look at the activity within the community. We want to know if the level of activity is going up and down. And more importantly, how many contributions are members in our communities making? There's a big difference from a community where 100 members participate once and where 100 members participate 100 times. And we need to track this because if the level of activity per active member begins to decline, that's a sign that your members are less interested in your community. And it's a big flashing red light that we need to be reacting to. Third, we track the sense of community. The sense of community is whether people feel a part of that community, whether the community has affected them at a psychological level. The communities that last for years and not months are those that have a very, very strong sense of community. The sense, of, the sense of community is a well-documented concept, and I recommend that you read the Psychological Sense of Community article by Macmillan and Chavez from 1985, I think. The other metric we also sometimes measure here is the return on investment. But since we've covered that all already, and it won't apply to some of the people that are watching this now, we're going to leave this out just for now. So when we're measuring a community, we do it through two different ways. One of them is we want to know the health of the community. So by the health, we want to know how the community is doing in a very snapshot way. So is a community um, healthy? Is it un unhealthy? Are there certain um, issues that the community needs, needs to deal with or be aware of right now? It's a snapshot of how the community is at a particular time. And you can diagnose everything that's going on in, in, in the community by measuring the health of that community. Next, we want to measure the progress of the community. We want to know how far along the community life cycle the community has progressed. A community that's in the maturity stage, as we covered last week, is very different from a community in the inception stage. And the success of a community manager is taking a community through the different stages of the community life cycle. This is how you make sure that the community is reaching its full potential. If you're not advancing that community through the community life cycle, then your community simply isn't reaching its full, its full potential. So there's a great opportunity to see what's going on here and what you should be doing next. So the strategy and the actions that you do for your community are first to resolve any health issues, and then to resolve the progress issues that might arise in, uh, in your community. So let's see how we diagnose the health of a community. First, we, we look at the growth. We want to know if the growth is going up or down. So this is the number of active contributors within the previous 30 days. 
So is that going up or down? And I wish it was this simple, but you have to be careful of different things here. First is that the number of active contributors will most likely go down during the summer months, during the um, winter months, especially over Christmas. So you have to be aware that it's not as straightforward as what you might like it to be. But you can tell if you're looking at, say, the previous six months of data right there, if, it, if, if the number of active contributors within the previous 30 days is going up or if it's going down. Second, we like to review the, the full conversion funnel. So that's from the visitor to the newcomer to when they've registered the community to when they contribute for the first time until they become a regular six, uh, six months later on. We spend a lot of time on this during the course because it's such an important con, uh, concept to master if you want to increase the number of people that are participating in your community. Most communities that we see have a terrible newcomer to a regular conversion funnel, which means that whilst lots of people might visit the, pl the platform and many of them might register to join that platform, very few are still participating in that community six months later on. So we went into some depth in this when we did the community life cycle. But what we know is that through each stage here, there are specific interventions you can make to improve this. So we want to measure this very early on to see where members are dropping out, because this will show us where we need to focus our efforts to get to immediately increase that number. Next, we want to look at if the level of activity which is the number of contributions in the previous 30 days is going up and down. And here we don't just want that baseline figure. We don't just want to know if the level of activity as a whole is going up and down. We want specifically to look at the number of contributions per active member. And what we do with our clients is that we actually try to remove the top and bottom 25% as well. Because what tends to happen at the top is that you have, say, maybe five or 10, mem 10, 10 members that are participating to such an extent that it's distorting the data for what everyone else is doing. So we try and chop that off. So now we know if the contributions per the average active member in a community is generally going up or down. And this will give us a very good indication of how healthy the community is. But then it's not just the contributions that they make, but the type of contributions that they make. Not all contributions are, e are equal. Someone that writes a blog post for a community, for example, is spending a lot of time and a lot of effort to construct that post. And that's more, more valuable than the typical forum post in a community, which itself is more, is more valuable than someone clicking like or clicking share on a piece of activity. Because the more time and effort they spent to create something in a community, the more hooked they are in, in that community in the future. And then we want to look at the sense of community. Is it getting stronger or weaker? And what specifically within that sense of community is getting stronger or weaker? And once we've done this, we look at the different elements of the community map manager role. So we look at what discussions and event and content items were the most popular and least popular. So you might find for, for, for discussions that status jockey and types of discussions are far more popular than any types of discussions. So you, it, might, it might make sense to do more of these. Or it might to see if there are particular topics that keep coming up when analyzing the top discussions in a community and seeing if you can introduce more more discussions about those topics and limit the ones that aren't that aren't that popular and the same with events and content as well by analyzing what the most popular types of content and events are you're going to get a very good feel for what you can stop doing and what to spend more uh, more time doing and this is a very important thing because you should be optimizing this every single month and there'll be other activities that you're doing as well but this is a trio of discussions, events, and content that you're creating, which is going to be mostly responsible for the level of activity in your community. So when we're diagnosing the health, we're looking at for the urgent red flag issues, such as a declining level of activity per member, but also for opportunities for improvement. 
especially a level of improvement that you can get in the short term, especially for a level of improvement for things like increasing the conversion ratio of newcomers into regulars. Because this is typically an intervention that you make once and it continues paying off for the rest of the community's lifespan. So the typical opportunities that we see for communities are identifying the best ch uh, channels of growth. So there will often be certain blogs or ebooks that your community will publish or uh, websites to send traffic your, to your community's way, who the quality of members that they're sending to you are, is far above the other types of members that you get from, say, a, ser a search engine result. So you want to, fo to focus your promotional efforts on the channels of growth that give you the best source of members the ones that are most likely to convert into regular active members of the community. So as we've already mentioned, optimizing the conversion funnel is usually a very big immediate win. And finally, measuring and optimizing every activity you do. If you get this right, your workload should decline and the results of the community should get immediately much better. So let's have a simple challenge here. Tell me what's happening in this graph right now. And I've just remembered that I can't see what you're saying, so I'm going to have to come out of full screen mode for this. Uh, sorry about this, just give me one second. So tell me what you see happening in this graph here. This is a graph that shows the number of unique new visitors to a community that we looked at some time ago. This should be a very simple thing. So Pruiti says that new that the new visitor numbers peaked in month eleven. What do the rest of you think? If you were analyzing this from a community perspective, what would this show you? So what this generally show what this generally show uh, shows you is that the number of unique new visitors to a community is broadly heading in the right di direction. If you were to draw a line of best fit through this, it would look a pretty he uh, healthy. So what you can say about this organization is that their efforts at getting people to getting more people to visit the community for the first time are looking quite successful. But now look at this. This shows the number of newcomers to registered members in the community. So people that visit the community to people that actually register to join the community. So I want you to try and, and analyze this and and tell and tell and tell tell me what's going on here. What would you recommend this organization here do? So when we're measuring um, the number of visitors to a community, we always want to track the number of unique new visitors. So it has to be unique, so it's not the same person that's visiting the community again and again. And it has to be the new visitors. And so that means it's people that are visiting the community for the first time. So that means to get that figure, you have to multiply the unique vi visitors by the percentage that are new in that community. And that will give you a fairly good idea of what's going on. So let's tackle this. What is this graph or what are, or what are the, these two graphs showing you? 
think think of this from a analyst perspective. If you were analyzing this community and making recommendations to uh, to this organization, what would you what would you know? So a couple of you are getting this broadly right. So what so what this shows is that even though this community ha has been very successful in getting more people to visit their platform for 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 the first time most likely as a result of their promotional efforts that are working quite well, their conversion ratio hasn't increased at all. In fact, to some extent, it's, that, it's actually dropped very slightly. And what they need to be doing is focusing more upon the conversion metrics because the number of people that are registering to actually join the community isn't growing at the same rate. So they're wasting a lot, a lot of potential here. So what we would be looking to do with a community like this is look through the life cycle and identify exactly where, where members are dropping out. So we know, for example, that when people visit the community, that that's, this part is okay. They're, the number of people that are visiting the community for the first time is generally okay. But something is happening between when they visit and when they click the confirmation um, e e e email here, that is preventing a lot of people from joining the community. So what we will be looking to do is to see how many people exactly are clicking the registration link to join the community. How many of them are completing that registration page? How many of them are opening the confirmation e uh, email? And how many of them are clicking the link? And this will show us exactly where people are dropping out. So now you get to see how the data-driven process is, is, uh, is working here. You identify exactly where members are dropping out and you can make specific interventions to improve this. But this is just one example of, of the sort of work that we should be doing. So if we want to collect this sort of data, so for growth, if we want to know the number of members who made a contribution within the previous thir uh, 30 days, the best thing possible is to get this data directly from the platform. Unfortunately, most platforms have absolutely terrible um, data packages. So what you're often left with is either dividing the total number of contributions by the total number of returning visits to, to the community. This will give you a broad uh, average here. Or alternatively, counting the number of, me of, me of members that make a, a a contribution on one day or one week and then multiply that by four or multiply it by the number of um, days or weeks that you have to do to get to one month. So you get a broad idea of what's happening here. So let's try something else. This is from a former client of ours. This is the total post within the previous 30 days. So we've included uh, several different metrics here, and I want you to tell me what's happening in this community. Try and be very an analytical about this. What does this data show us? You can spend a little bit more time on this. So, so Ella says less discussions, more more polls. Are you sure about that? It looks like the number of discussions is going up. BJ Wishing Sky says a few people are doing most of the talking. Kristen says while the number of active members may not be increasing, their contributions are increasing. I would argue that the number of active members is, incre uh, is, in is increasing, not by much, but it has increased since the beginning. Remember, for this sort of data, we're looking at trends here. We're not just looking at the final data point, we're looking at the broad trends of where that data is going. So you have to think about the line of best fit. 
So Pruity says contributions are going up, polls are going down. Um, I think that's wrong because the polls is clear is clearly riot rising. Catherine says same people contributing. Arthur says the number of active members is declining. Are you sure about that? Or is that only over the last one or two months? Um, but the total number of contributions is rising. So a hardcore of members is forming. You need to focus on getting new new members. So this is good, it's very analytical and it makes a clear recommendation as well. Uh, Karen says members are reactive but not posting much new discussions. I'm not sure how you're getting to that conclusion. So David says post per members are going up, meaning the health of the community is, is rising. Jeff says contributions divided by active, so sorry, contributions and active members is, incre is increasing. So would you guys say that the health of this community is getting better or is it getting worse? Just a quick um, worse or better, please. Most of you say better, 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 worse, better. So let's look at the number of activity per active member and see what this says. This is why activity alone is interesting, but it doesn't tell you everything that you need to know. So now we can see the number of average contributions per active member in, in, in the community. And again, it's a little bit inconclusive here. Because what you're seeing is that the number of active members, sorry, the number of contributions per active member is broadly rising. So there's being a bit a bit of a dip, but now it's broad, it's broadly rising. But here's another more, more important question. Why is it rising? What is changing here? What's driving these contributions? <laughs> okay, so forget about vacations and things like that. That's not the answer we're, we're looking for. Although that is a very va valid point most of the time. So some of you are saying mostly recommendations. Okay, but let's go a bit deeper than, than that. What does that mean if it's mostly recommendations? I know we're taking a very long time to get to the point, but I think this is a really important point to spend some time on. So remember what we said at the start of, of the lesson here, that not all types of contributions are equal. And we know that certain things such as liking or voting in, in a poll, the activity that doesn't take as much time or mental em, um, energy to perform is the types of activity that aren't as valuable to a community. So the most valuable type of activity that we have here is the discussions because it's the discussions that ultimately ultimately lead to value within that community. And what we can see from the discussions here is that they've generally stayed relatively static. So even though the average number of contributions per active member is, is relatively higher from what it originally was, it's not being driven by the right type of activity. It's being driven by more people voting in polls. It's being driven by a blip in the average number of recommendations, but not really by the number of discussions. So the health of the community isn't as good as what we might think. And it's not bad, but it's not great either. There's definitely much more potential here. And what we can also say is that increase the number of weak level of activity, such as recommendations and poll votes, doesn't really increase the number of, uh, of, uh, of discussions. So next we look at the sense of community. This is where we look at the sense of community index. So we use a index called SCI2, which you can find on the internet. 
and we do a, sur a survey amongst the people that are in that community. And then we use a stratified sampling technique. So what we try to make sure is that we're getting data from everyone in the community, and we're not just getting data from the types of people that would love to, to, help, to help us in the community. The problem with doing surveys in your community is that the people that respond to this are the same people that are going to feel the strongest sense of community. That's why they're responding. So you have to be very careful not to bias the, the results of this through a sampling bias. So you have to make sure that you have quotas representing each tiers. So divide it by the level of activity into probably about four tiers and sample a relevant percentage from each of these tiers. So what we did this with this community is that we is that we found this was the result. So let's try this one one more time. This is really easy. What does this graph show? There's no trick question here at all. This is measuring the score using the sense of community index. So yeah, what this shows is that the sense of community is going up in a significant way. There's absolutely no trick question here. So the survey that we use is the SCI index. So this shows how well, um, how much people agree with the statements that are being made and then uses score based upon that. You might need to adapt this a little bit for, for your community, but it's still a great survey you can use. But what's more important, and I'm going to keep this not in full screen mode because I want to see your, your, your responses on GoToWebinar. But what this also shows is within the sense of community, what specific things are driving the increased levels of a sense of community? So if you haven't done any reading about this before, this graph might not make that much sense. But the sense of community is basically comprised of four different ele elements. It's a sense of membership and identification with, with the other members that are part of the group. So can members recognize who else is part, is, 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 is part, is part, part of that group? Do they have some sort of symbols, systems, and a boundary to being a member of that community? It includes influence. Do people that are in that community feel like they can influence that community? Do they feel like they have a level of influence over that group? Next is the shared emotional connection. So do people within that group feel like they have a shared emotional connection with the other members? Do they feel the same emotions at the same time as other people in that group? The strongest communities oscillate at what we call the same emotional frequency. And finally, reinforcement of needs. Are the needs of the members and the needs of the community aligned? This has a lot to do with the social identity theory theory of uh, communities. So a quick summary here. Um, I think this is the last graph that we will spend much time on today, is that what this clearly shows is that a lot of the increase in the sense of community is being driven by influence. And the reason for this was quite simple. With this client, we looked initially at some quick wins that we could put in place. And one of the things we did is that we looked at the influence score within that community. And we saw that there were certain things that we could do that, that would help members feel a greater sense of influence, such as giving people positions within that community, making sure that we were breaking the community down into more of an individual effort instead of a group effort to prevent the social loafing that occurs within that community. So we spent a lot of time on that sort of intervention, and we saw very good results from that. So what we could do next, looking at this data here, is that we might decide to increase the shared emotional connection. So that might mean having more discussions that are based around emotive topics. So members are more likely to feel a stronger emotional connection as a result of that. So you can see when you have this data, you can break down the elements of, the, of something like a sense of community into very specific things. And once you know what these things are, you know exactly what you can work on to increase that figure. So after we know the health of the community, we've looked at all of the potential issues within that community, we've looked at the opportunities for immediate improvement within that community. 
we look at the pro the progress. Where is the community within the community life cycle? Uh, life cycle. And so to measure the progress of a community, we look at the type of growth and activity. So it doesn't just matter if growth and activity is taking place. It matters that it's doing so in a sustainable way. So members that join the community are joining without us prompting them all the time. Because if it's always being driven by us, then it's not really reaching critical mass. And that activity is being generated by the community and not always by us. So what we use is a community life cycle. And we'll send you a document in a couple of weeks that will outline how this all works in more detail. But the important thing is that in the initially, in the inception stage, all the growth and activity is generated by you. This is why we, we measure the number of members that you invite to join the community compared to the total number of members that join the community. We measure the number of responses to discussions initiated by, by the community compared to the responses to discussions initiated by, by you. So you have very clear metrics that you can use here. And then you can track where in the life cycle your community is. We also know if, for example, that the level of growth is in the 90 to 99 percent, but the level of activity is still within the 50 to 9 to 9 to 90 percent, you know you, you need to focus on getting more members initiating their own activity. And that might mean, for example, that members in the community have a certain social fear of initiating their own discussions. They're not sure quite what the format sh uh, should be, or there might be issues like that. So then you might work with a small group of members to make sure that the number of people that are initiating discussions becomes very diverse. You might be reaching out to members, asking them what their biggest ch uh, ch challenge in the community is, and then getting them to initiate a topic about that within the community. So you see there are very specific things that you can do to increase your community along that life cycle. Because once other members see what other members are doing, they're more likely to, co to copy that example. And what you also see here is that we include the sense of community. Because it's not just the growth of the community that matters, it's not just the level of activity. It matters whether these members feel a stronger sense of community with each other. So we use a very specific sense of community score here. So you need to make sure that your community is affecting its members at a psychological level. So let's have a couple of uh, couple, a couple more graphs and then we'll wrap uh, this, uh, this webinar up. So what does this graph here, here show? So if we want to know the total number of new members, if we want to know whether the growth is still in the inception stage, the activity stage, we look at the total number of new, of new members um, that have joined the community and we take away those that were invited by the community manager. They might be invited di directly by the community manager or it might be those that were on a, ma a mailing list that were invited to join by some sort of promotional effort by the community manager because ultimately the, these things aren't they, aren't they sustainable. So what does this graph show? Or what can you summarize based upon this graph? I have to say, some of you have been really nailing the answers to the questions today. So Katie says this graph shows that this community is reaching mature the uh, reaching maturity based upon growth. Who agrees with her? Ella says the community is popular. Members are inviting others. Ryan says upward trends in users joining on their own accord. Arthur says total number of new members is rising. The number of those invited by the CM is slowly declining. The community is growing more and more by itself. Karen says the community is growing on its own. CM need not invest as much time there. That's pretty much the perfect answer. Once a community reaches their maturity stage, to the extent that this community has, then gradually the community manager can spend less and less time doing this because it's almost entirely self-sustaining um, self growth. 
So you can see that the that the community reached that crit that critical mass point very early on. It reached it between February and March, and then it increased and it dropped, but then it's been rapidly increasing since. And this is relatively standard for most of the communities that we come across. So let's try this for act, for activity as well. The way that we measure the progression of activity within a community is that we look at the total number of discussions to posts initiated, sorry, the total number of posts to discussions initiated by, by the community manager, and then the total number of posts to discussions initiated by the community. So when we subtract one from the other, the total posts from the community management posts, and this show, shows us how many posts were initiated by or in response to community-led activity. So again, a quick analysis here as well, please. What, um, what is this graph and what is this data showing? Again, there's absolutely no trick question here at all. Jeff says that the, that the, that the, sorry, Jeff says that the community is mature. Who agrees with Jeff? What is the definition of a mature community, Jeff? David says the community has moved on from the from the inception stage. Katie says it's in the establishment stage. No, Jeff, mature mature maturity is ninety to ninety nine percent of posts. So Karen says CM might be able to start easing up on activity in, in initiation, would watch a, a while more. Again, Ka uh, Karen has nailed this question. Remember, the goal here isn't just to describe what's happening, but to make recommendations based upon this to your organization, to your client, or for most of you, just to yourself, or what you should spend your time doing. And that's why it's very important to get data like this. So this community is in the establishment stage. It's generally looking quite, quite, he quite healthy. It's going in the right direction. And you can gradually begin easing down on the number of discussions that the community, that the community manager initiates, which means that you can then focus on different activities. You'll remember what we covered in the last webinar how as the community advances from the inception stage to the establishment stage to the maturity stage, that you need to shift your tasks over as a result to make sure that you are always optimizing the limited amount of time that you have. So once you know that one part is sustainable, as this is looking like it, uh, it will soon be, then you can focus more upon say optimizing activity or getting volunteers in or doing any of the other tasks that you should be doing in the establishment stage of the community life cycle. And what you can also do if you want to show off or if for just to see if there's anything that's clearly lacking is that you can put these two um, uh, lines on the same graph. So this will show you if anything is particularly lagging behind. So we knew there was one point around month three when the level of activity was significantly, was significantly behind the level of growth. So what we did is that we spent less time on growth activity, and you can see the dip here, and more time on um, community management tasks that would lead to greater activity initiated by, by the community. And you can see that it quickly uh, caught, uh, caught up. And then it's diverged a bit, but not enough to be a big concern to us. So you can see that both of these lines are heading in the right direction. And then with the sense of community, you can also plot this and show where uh, this is in the community life cycle. And what you'll notice here is that the sense of community, if we go back to the life cycle, the sense of community is significantly lag lagging behind everything else. So we know for a mature online community, if you see here, so in the inception stage, there's no sense of community at all. But in the, establishment, in the establishment stage of 0 to 24 and maturity 24 to 72, we know that it's been lagging behind a bit and it's catching up now and it's starting to, to, to produce significant results. So based upon what we've covered so, 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 so far, uh, I'm not going to uh, 
asked us as a question because I know we're completely out of time. But based upon what we've done, now you know to where to focus your efforts. Now you can make clear recommendations to your organization, to the community managers that uh, that that you make that you manage. Once you get your new uh, strategist role, you know where to spend your time and to get the absolute best results that you can. That's why data is so important. And I think it's a shame that so many community professionals don't bother to collect this data. Getting the data that we showed you here is the hard part. Analyzing it is really simple. It's pretty e easy to look at a graph like this and see exactly what's going on and what you should be working on. The hard part is getting this data in the first place. And this is why you need so someone or you need to set aside a lot of time just to do this.